So we're looking at the uh, vertebral column here, and um, you should have labeled the cervical vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae, the lumbar vertebrae. Uh, you should have also labeled the sacrum and the coccyx, the intervertebral foramina, and also the intervertebral disc. In addition, you should have labeled the rib facet. Um, I'm going to switch over here to the pin. And the cervical vertebrae are basically the first seven vertebrae. Um, so I'm going to write one through seven up here. You should have also done the same thing. So we have a total of seven. And they actually na they name them. Um, for example, this would be C1, C2, C3, and C4, and it would go on like that. The thoracic vertebrae, um, we actually have 12 of them, and it's numbers 8 through 19. So we have a total of 12. And the thoracic vertebrae, these are actually the vertebrae that are attached to the ribs. And the rib is actually attached about here. The ribs and uh, they actually articulate or move right here this actually forms a little joint at the rib facet and the, the white that you see is actually cartilage your lumbar vertebrae if you notice um, are the largest of all the vertebrae which makes sense because you know they bear the weight of your, your body so that's why they're, they're larger um, it's also true that this is where we see a lot of the uh, back pain and injuries because they do bear the weight of the body. And so a lot of back pain origina originates from the lumbar vertebrae, which you actually have um, five of these, and we're looking at numbers 20 through 24 for a total of five. The sacrum is actually 25 through 29, but the difference between the sacrum versus the rest of the vertebral column is that the vertebrae is actually fused, and we have a total of five fused vertebrae. The coccyx, or your ta tailbone, um, is actually um, also considered to be vertebrae, but there are, there are four fused vertebrae down here. And we're looking at numbers 30 through 33. So all in all, you have 33 vertebrae. Um, 24 are not fused, but then you have nine that are. Looking over here, um, I want you guys just to understand that your spinal cord runs right along this area here. So your spinal cord is actually inside of there, which is, you know, this is a great um, protective armor for your spinal cord. And then these intervertebral foramina, um, they're actually holes, they're spaces. And what happens is, you know, your nerves branch off of the spinal cord and come out. And so if this hole gets compromised, if it, if it you know, decreases in size, we can have a pinching of our, our nerves. So sometimes, you know, our disc, which this is your cartilage, your, your disc, this is actually made up of cartilage, which is a type of connective tissue. You have cartilage all over your body, your ears, and in between all of your joints and your nose. You guys know that. Um, but sometimes the, the cartilage or the disc can bulge out and actually bulge out into this space. And that can cause nerve pain. These nerves can be pinched. That can cause pain. And whenever your vertebrae slip or, you know, they move this way or this way, um, your, your muscles in your back will actually start to pull on the vertebrae to get it back into alignment. So now, not only do you maybe have nerve pain, but you might also have 
back pain because of muscles you know, constricting. And so you've got both things going on, which is not fun at all if you've ever experienced back pain. Um, chiropractors, you know, they believe that if all of your nerves are able to um, come out of these spaces and we don't have any pinching of the nerves, that the nerves are able to communicate to all of the organs of the body. And so basically your body's going to be in homeostasis or better homeostasis. So um, that's why chiropractors are so adamant about, you know, routinely going and having your, your spine aligned. So we, we have all of these nerves able to communicate to the various places of our body. Another thing that I want to mention is that you're actually a little taller in the morning than you are at night. Um, and that has to do with the cartilage in between your vertebrae. You know, as you, as you go throughout your day, um, you kind of press down on the, the disc, you, you become a little dehydrated, and so the disc actually gets smaller as the day wears on. So if you're dra driving really late at night, um, you might get out of your car, go inside, you're going to lay down. Overnight, all of these, um, these discs, they kind of poof back up, and so you get in your car in the morning, you might actually have to adjust your rearview mirror because you're actually t a little taller from, let's say, your sacrum, you know, up to the top of your vertebral column. It's not very much. You're only talking maybe some millimeters there, but it's enough to notice, especially with the rearview mirror. So uh, that is your vertebral column, and I believe next we're going to move on to the sacrum and the coccyx. So here we go. It's a better view of our sacrum and our coccyx. Um, so things that you were supposed to label on here, um, definitely should have know. You should know that this this is your sacrum bone, and from here down, this is your coccyx or your tailbone. And um, you should have also labeled the sacral canal and the sacral hiatus. You also need to know the difference between the front versus the back. Um, this is the front, meaning if you are standing in front of a skeleton, looking at the skull, um, the face, this is what you would see, this view. If you walked around to the other side or the back of the skeleton, this is what you would be looking at. And I always think of the back of a dinosaur with, you know, the spines. Something worth noting here is that the spinal cord actually continues on down into this canal. Um, so even though, you know, your vertebrae kind of ends here, you know, these are still fused vertebrae, but your canal, or sorry, your spinal cord continues to go on down through that canal. All of these holes that you see too, um, in bones, wherever you see a hole, that's just basically a place for nerves and blood vessels to be able to travel through that bone to get to where they need to go. That is your sacrum and your coccyx. And now we are moving on to, I believe, the pelvic girdle. Now, unfortunately, this is a different view than what you have. But I think that you guys can um, hopefully figure things out um, based on the difference between what you're seeing here and, and what you have on your paper. Um, you are supposed to label the coccyx, which on my view, you can't see. But that, again, is the, is the tailbone. As far as the coxal bone, um, you're looking at basically the pelvis, and the pelvis is made up of your two coxal bones. So you have one here and one here. Your sacrum, and then hiding is your coccyx. You can't see it on here. But um, basically, this big bone right here, okay, this is your coxal bone. AKA your hip bone. 
You also have um, your sacrum. You should have labeled your sacrum. So um, basically, you know, this is your sacrum bone. Uh, the sacral canal can't see it in this view, um, but we just labeled that in the other picture. And also the sacral hiatus, again, you can't see it from this view, but we just labeled it in the previous picture. The symphysis pubis, um, on your piece of paper, you're not able to actually see it, but we can see it on, in this view. And so I'm just going to go ahead and highlight that, the symphysis pubis. This is basically a piece of cartilage, and um, it's found in between the two coxal bones. The pelvic brim, um, again, I said on your picture you can't see it, but we can see it in this view. And it's basically this bony chamber. And uh, during labor, the baby has to be able to fit through this. So if the baby's head is too big, then the female is not going to be able to deliver naturally. She's not going to be able to have a vaginal birth, so we're going to have to do a cesarean section. Pubic arch, um, said to add in a line, but the pubic arch is basically this area here. The sacral promontory um, on your piece of paper, it says can only see on skeleton, cannot label, but we can see it on this view. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight that. The ileum, um, this area of the coxal bone is classified as the ileum, so I'm going to go ahead and also highlight that. Which, by the way, if you're looking at a, a male versus a female pelvis, um, women typically tend to have wider, more flared um, pelvises, and that's to do for the baby as well. You know, the baby has to be able to fit through here, and that's why we're wider. Um, women just have a bigger pelvis than a man. The acetabulum, um, or acetabulum, a lot of kids kind of make up their own pronunciation for that, um, is, is here. And basically, this is the socket. This is where the femur is going to fit in to the coxal bone. I'm going to go ahead and label that. The ischium. Um, the ischium is actually this, this region here of your, your hip bone or coxal bone. Um, and then the region closest to, I guess you can consider it, your pubic area is the pubis. Um, so this is the ischium area. And we have the pubis area. And that's it for the pelvic girdle. Um, these large holes here this is, again, it's a space for blood vessels and nerves to be able to travel through. All right, so now we're going to move on to the thoracic cage.